Those who have been connected with the series of Beyond Law CLC know that we have been taking different perspectives, which can audience UPSC aspirants, judicial aspirants, and as well as the practicing lawyers and the judges also to have the insights on the topics, which could help them not only in the practice, but as a student and even otherwise to understand. Like today, when we have amongst us the partners of the present webinars, Sadiq Mayers and who's being represented today by Mr. Manish Lamba, the general counsel from the DLF. So that even the general counsels and the different managers, etc., could also understand. And we all know that injunctions play a vital part for understanding of law and even other factors we talk of injunction stays etc and we also know the aspects of temporary injunctions and permanent injunctions the role of civil procedure court read by deliberate upon the order 39 and similarly on under the specific relief act and keeping in view that we have participants not only in respect of the students coupled with the practicing persons. Therefore, we requested Justice Abraham Matthew, who has, who has always been kind enough to share his knowledge. And those who have been connected with us are on our channel of Beyond Law CLC or on a page Beyond Law CLC would see that his knowledge sharing process has always, because he illustrates, explains in a very elucidated manner. And that's where the topic was, law of injunctions, theory and practice. What are the subtle differences? Before I would request Justice Abraham Matthew, who himself is an epitome of knowledge, I would request Mr. Manish Lamba to share, before we request Mr. Abraham Matthew, as well as the CMRP to share the knowledge. Thank you, thank you, Vikas. Uh, auspicious day. Not only because Justice Ibrahim has agreed to join us uh, today. Today happens to be Navroz. Firstly, a very, very warm and happy Navroz to everybody. And this is the spring equinox. So India being an agricultural country, this becomes a very important event. The other thing is that today is the World Happiness Day. The object is not uh, law itself, it's not be all end all. It is for the orderly, happy society. And today is the World Happiness Day. By law and its instruments and its applicability, we want to spread the message of happiness. And uh, speaking for Sadgamya, Sadgamya again uh, is a word which has been derived from our uh, uh, ancient Vedic literature. And it also happens to be the name of uh, Justice Krishna Iyer's residence. The objective is to attain from, um, from unknowingness to knowledge and from darkness to light and from, and, uh, for, and, and from a normal life to a life of enlightenment to achieve those purposes. So with these objectives, that law does not remain for itself only and not only for the lawyers, but in order to create a atmosphere of justice, equity, and good conscience and create an orderly society that we have partnered with uh, uh, your organization and educational institutions. So therefore the industry is here, the educational institutions are there, the practicing lawyers are there. And of course, um, the gems from our judiciary in order to uh, spread the message of knowledge, knowledge be free for all and, and may, use the per, uh, may, may be used for the purposes of the betterment of a society. Happy World Happiness Day. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. As Mr. Lamba said, this uh, ultimate objective of the law is happiness. But law itself does not give us happiness. It is only a means to achieve happiness. So pursue the happiness. OK. An orderly society is suspected. That is the objective of law, to maintain order and thereby 
happiness in the society so as we all know the court of injunction is a court of equity it is the discretion of courts to grant or not to grant injunctions it is a preventive relief preventive relief how it is granted it is granted in the form of injunctions either temporary or perpetual this is what section 36 of the specific relief act says there is a classification as the section 36 indicates perpetual or temporary injunction what is the basis of this classification the basis of the classification is the period during which it is ordered to be enforced nothing else so if it lasts for a certain period only we call it a temporary injunction that is until the disposal of the suit or before that whatever it be and if it continues even thereafter then we call it a perpetual injunction but there is another classification also that classification is on the basis of the nature of the order the first classification is on the basis of the period during which is ordered to be enforced the second is the base the basis is the nature of the order it is prohibitory or mandatory so that is the basis the nature of the order is the basis for classification into prohibitory and mandatory but you see the words or the expression prohibitory injunction that you will not see in these sections instead you will see perpetual injunctions why the only the term perpetual injunction is used and why it is not said that a permanent prohibitory injunction though we call it a permanent injunction always in the practice of the profession is to call it a prohibitory injunction permanent prohibitory injunction but the expression used in the specific relief act is only perpetual injunction even the word prohibitory is not there there is a reason for it the reason is this say only a prohibitory injunction is perpetual or all perpetual injunctions prohibitory only in other words a mandatory injunction is never a perpetual one a mandatory injunction a decree for mandatory injunction ceases to have effect the moment the act which is ordered to be done is done then it becomes ineffective it has no force at all on the other hand a perpetual injunction means it is in perpetuity it's ordinarily that is in the common in the in our uh, in the as we understand it it is in perpetuity may not be so in all cases but it is like that only so that's the difference between perpetual injunction and mandatory injunction or that is the basis uh, that is the uh, basis on which it is divided or this classified into perpetual and uh, temporary injunction prohibitory and mandatory injunction the term perpetual injunction alone is used because it always can be only prohibitory injunction that is the reason okay what are the features of a perpetual injunction all, all of us know the fundamentals uh, in this law of injunction i need not repeat it always but uh, we can just have to refresh our memory you can say that the features of perpetual injunction one it is granted only by a decree it is granted only by a decree the second it can never be granted without a notice to the other party and hearing of the other party then it can be given only on merits then it is a restraints from asserting a right contrary to the rights of the plaintiff it also restrains the defendant from committing an act which is contrary to the rights of the plaintiff the object is to prevent to prevent the breach of an obligation existing in favor of the plaintiff these are the features of a perpetual injunction we can say now when it should be granted we get it in section 38 in case of obligation arise from contract or the court is guided by the rules and provisions in chapter 2 of uh, the specific relief act 
that in case of defendants invading, threatening, or uh, to invade the plaintiff's rights, enjoyment of property, when the defendant is a trustee of the property of the plaintiff, then there exist no standards for ascertaining the actual damage caused or likely to be caused by the invasion. And the, the invasion is such that the compensation is money is not an adequate relief. Then injunction is necessary to prevent multiplicity of judicial proceedings. These are the principles uh, which govern this uh, granting of a perpetual injunction. Then when it should be restrained, uh, it should be refused. Section 41 is there. I need not uh, repeat it because it takes time. But the only thing we have to take note of is that by the amendment of the, uh, 2018, the cross H A small h small a has been inserted, which relates to the infrastructure projects. You can read it. I think you have all, uh, you have already uh, read it, and there is nothing to be ad uh, added. Nobody one knows it. But when we come to section 41 E, then in section 42, if contract comprises an affirmative agreement to do a certain act coupled with a negative agreement, express or implied, not to do a certain act, the court may grant an injunction to perform the negative agreement. How this negative agreement is enforced? That is what. So when a positive, because we know that it depends mainly on this uh, uh, special skill of a person. Suppose a person wants to sing for a company for one year and she undertakes that he will not sing for uh, any other company for this period. We cannot compel her to sing because it depends upon her skill, personal uh, uh, efficiency, we can say, competency. But we can, the court can say that you shall not sing for any other person for this uh, one year. That's all this uh, section means, nothing else. Now we see, we are coming to the practice now, theory, forget the theory for the time being. Now, the question is, in a suit for injunction, whether the question of title can be agitated and whether it can be decided. Normally, in a suit for injunction relating to immoral properties, especially possession of immoral properties, title of the person, the plaintiff, is irrelevant. That is what we have learned and that is what we have been taught. But there are some circumstances in which the question of title also is liable to be considered. In other words, question of title is not precluded from consideration because depending on the facts of the case, in a suit for injunction, title also may become irrelevant. This is what the Supreme Court has uh, uh, decided in the latest decision, 2020, volume 3, SEC 780. In a case where the granting of injunction depends upon the question of title, then it is necessary to decide title. Because of failing me, you cannot grant the court, cannot grant injunction. So if the granting of injunction depends upon the title of the party, then the question of title also has to be considered in the suit for injunction. What happens in law, uh, in practice? In practice, suppose it is not at all necessary for the plaintiff to assert or allege that he has possession as well as title. It is sufficient for him to allege that he has possession. But suppose the plaintiff alleges that he has title to the property as well as possession of the property and the defendant denies his title to the property, what happens? There is a material, there is a, a material fact has been alleged and it is denied in the return statement. And as we all know under Order 14 Rule 1 CPC, when a material fact is alert and it is denied by the opposite party, then an issue arises. So an issue arises if it 
it is alleged by asserted by the title is asserted by the plaintiff and denied by the defendant an issue arises and if an issue arises the court has to decide it if the plaintiff has not paid court for is court for uh, court fees for it the court has to direct the plaintiff to pay court for it uh, court fees for it otherwise it will not be decided that appears to be the law so if the injunction granting of the injunction depends on the title of the proof of the title of the plaintiff that has to be considered if that is not considered it is not possible for the court to grant injunction so we cannot say that it is a universal rule that in no suit of injunction title is relevant we cannot say title may be relevant depending on the facts pleaded by the parties so if in a suit for injunction a decree is passed it depends only on possession suit on possession alone nothing else title is not at all relevant it is not at all agitated it is not at all decided then will it operate as a judicator for a second suit naturally it will not operate as a judicator because possession it can change hands any time it depends but in a case where the question of title was agitated and decided then will it operate as a judicator the supreme court has said that it operates as a judicator in a subsequent suit that is 1994 volume 2 ecc 14 that is equivalent to ar 1994 supreme court 152 so if in a suit for injunction injunction is granted on the basis of the title and in a subsequent suit the same question arises it becomes a restitutor operate as restitutor this has been reiterated by the supreme court in 2005 volume 6 sec 202 okay in a suit for injunction possession alone is uh, relevant ordinarily but suppose it is a dispute a boundary dispute it is a boundary dispute then can we call it it is a suit for injunction alone simpliciter injunction simpliciter there may be facts which show that it is not actually a suit for injunction but it takes in the question of title also boundary dispute so in such cases it is the title also will have to be decided in boundary disputes when there is no boundary the court has to find out the title or on the basis of which alone a decree for injunction can be granted that is 2020 volume 3 cc 2020 volume 3 cc 780 so suppose the plaintiff and the defendant had entered into an agreement for sale of a property immobile property and before the expiry of the period of agreement the plaintiff files a suit for injunction is it maintainable and suppose it is disposed of and is the plaintiff entitled to file a suit for specific performance later the dispute is the controversy is whether the subsequent suit will be barred under the provisions of order to or rule to cpc order to rule to cpc because the defendant may argue that the plaintiff should have filed a suit for injunction suit for specific performance instead of a suit for injunction and in that suit for specific performance he should have prevailed for injunction it are the same cause of action so that may be his contention in one decision the supreme court held that it is a hit by order to rule to cpc 
the second suit on the same basis of the same cause of action is barred the principle is correct but the application of law does not appear to be correct or the supreme court has later acknowledged that it is not correct though not in terms the supreme court held that in 2015 to volume 11 is easy 12 that the second suit for specific performance is not barred the supreme court has distinguished the earlier decision the urgos industries case and said that the second suit is not barred by order to rule to cpc by the principle embodied in order to rule to cpc this has been uh, reiterated in 2018 volume 6 is easy 733 so the plaintiff is actually entitled to uh, or the defendant is entitled to be in possession of the property till the period of agreement is over till the period of agreement is over suppose he wants to shift his house he wants to find out another house and by the time uh, the property is sought to be alienated then what happens if the property is sought to be alienated then the plaintiff what is the remedy a suit for injunction alone and suppose 6 months is the period of time the plaintiff has 6 months time to find out he is a fund for purchasing the property he also is the he also has that right as the defendant has to has the right to uh, reside in the property for 6 months as he wants to shift his uh, residence to some other property both how that right so that means even before the expiry of the period of uh, agreement the plaintiff is entitled to maintain a suit for injunction because of the facts of the case this has been now recognized by the supreme court there was an earlier decision also that is a 2005 ar supreme court weekly 3311 that is a case in which the suit was for injunction it was filed even after the expiry of the period of agreement thereafter the suit for specific performance was filed the supreme court held that there is there is no bar now we shall come to mandatory injunction mandatory injunction mandatory injunction is not covered by perpetual injunction it is not covered by perpetual injunction the reason i have already told you once the positive act is directed to be done by the party is performed the decree becomes ineffective it has no further effect but only mandatory injunction granted by decrees as distinguished from orders past pendent entities covered by section 39 and the direction in the decree it is not prohibitory in nature the direction is to do a particular act a positive act the direction is to perform an act the object is again to prevent breach of an obligation for example defendants building projects over the plaintiff's land defendants trees branches overhanging the plaintiff's land unauthorized construction made by corner unauthorized construction by lessee these are all examples then mandatory injunction may be prayed for along with the prayer for a recovery of possession so both prayers can may be included both reliefs can be prayed for in the same suit a recovery of possession of the land and mandatory injunction 
to remove the unauthorized construction that can be done. Then, before we go to this uh, temporary injunction, prohibitory injunction, it is uh, proper that we consider temporary mandatory injunction, interim injunction, interim mandatory injunction, whether interim mandatory injunction can be granted. There is no prohibition in granting interim mandatory injunction. In appropriate cases, interim mandatory injunction can be granted in a suit. The object is, the purpose is generally to preserve or restore the status quo on the last non-contested status which preceded the pending controversy until the final hearing when full relief may be granted or to compel the undoing of those acts that have been illegally done or the restriction of restoration of that which was wrongfully taken from the party complaining. A year 1990 Supreme Court 867, 861, Dorab Kawasji's case. Dorab Kawasji Warden versus Kumi Soral, Soral Warden. Yes, this has been reiterated in 2004, Volume 7, SEC, 478. 478. This was followed by another decision, 2011, Volume 6, SEC 73. It has enumerated the guidelines. The guidelines are given in this decision. One, the plaintiff has a strong case. I think that is, it is of a higher standard than a prima facie case required in a prohibitive injunction case. It should be of a higher standard. Then second is, it is necessary to prevent irreparable and serious injury. which normally not be considered in terms of money. That is the second one. The third one is, balance of convenience is in favor of the person seeking the relief. That is the third one. But this does not mean that these are the only three guidelines. The Supreme Court has clarified that this is not exhaustive nor complete. That is in 2011, 6 SEC 73. And the latest decision on the point is 2018, Volume 17 SEC. 203, which is a three judge bench decision. Now we, we are coming to temporary injunction. Temporary injunction. So in practice, we have seen that. Instead of granting an injunction order, interim injunction order, or an interim injunction order, some courts pass the order of status quo, order to maintain status quo. Is it correct? When you, the party, we know that an interim injunction 
order means uh, it is uh, always pass the as party without the notice to the opposite party the opposite party is not before the court the court actually does not know what is the situation what is the present position so the court grants it as party so in such cases instead of granting an injunction order if the court passes an order of status quo what is the consequence see the court actually does not know what the status quo is a court without knowing what the status quo is shall not pass an order of status quo that is what the supreme court has said in um 2006 three acc 2006 three acc three that is a year 2006 supreme court 1474 kishor kumar khaitan versus pravin kumar singh so a court shall not pass an order of uh, order of status quo without knowing what the status quo is it should be an undisputed one or the court should have evidence before the court what the status quo is otherwise what happens further litigations the court is throwing the matter into the hands of the police the police will have to interfere the police will have to decide what the status quo was so that should be avoided the party should not be satisfied with an order of status quo and if the party if the court wants that the party should maintain status quo or if the court wants to see that the plaintiff in whose favor the injunction or temporary injunction order is granted does not take benefit of it and do some injustice in the property what the court should do the court shall pass an order of injunction against the respondent defendant and at the same time direct the plaintiff not to do a particular act positive acts in the property suppose it is a property which gives income then the court shall direct the petitioner the plaintiff not to take income from the property until further orders of the court that means even if the order passed against the defendant happens to be wrong one an erroneous one no prejudice will be caused to the defendant the plaintiff will not take you and take undue advantage of this wrong order so ordinarily a prudent judge would always direct the plaintiff also from not taking any income from the property or doing any positive act in the property now we come to section 37 of the specific relief act section 37 see section 37 says Companies are, are such as to are to continue until a specified time, so it is a limited in time, or until the further orders of the court, and they may be granted at any stage of the suit, and are regulated by the Code of Civil Procedure. A perpetual injunction can only be granted. What way? That's a different one. So it may be granted at any stage of the suit. granting of it is regulated by cpc then it continues the nature of it is that it continues only until a specified time time or further orders of the court that is why it is called a temporary nature now we see section 94 section 94 c of the cpc so it is regulated by cpc granting of injunction temporary injunction section 94 deals with the supplementary proceedings clause c says that to prevent the ends of justice from being defeated the court may grant temporary injunction and in case of disobedience 
the court may commit the guilty to the civil prison and attach and sell his property. But as we all know, the sections of the CPC only give jurisdiction to the court. How this jurisdiction should be exercised is mentioned in the rules. So the section jurisdiction to the court and the rules give or direct the court how to exercise that jurisdiction, that power. So we have to go to order 39. Order 39 says, in what cases temporary injunction may be granted? I need not repeat it. I need not repeat it because uh, that is a time consuming one. The same now we have to bear in mind three orders are not orders of injunction. The question before us is whether all prohibitive or prohibitory orders passed by a court are orders of injunction. What about guardianship? It is an order not to pay a certain amount to a certain person to the defendant. Don't pay it to the defendant. It is an order, prohibitory order. And it directs the plaintiff from, uh, sorry, the defendant from receiving it. So it is a prohibitory order against uh, a third party as well as this uh, garnishee, third party called the garnishee as well as this. Is it an order of injunction? It is not an order of injunction because an order of injunction is passed only in the situations uh, given in order 39. Order, order 39. And the garnishee proceedings are not governed by order 39. Two thousand nine, volume five, SEC six six five. All prohibitory orders are not orders of injunction. And if an order of injunction is violated, the consequence is provided in order thirty nine rule to a CPC. And if a garnishee order is uh, taken as an order of injunction, what would happen? If the garnishee disobeys this, order 13 and rule 12 will have to be invoked. That is not permitted. So that is the significance of the distinction between an order of injunction and other prohibitory orders. So it has a significance. Now, how an order of injunction or how it may be proved, the entitlement of the party to the order, order of injunction may be proved. <coughs> the provision itself says, order 13 and rule 1 itself says, the proof may be either by affidavit or otherwise. Or otherwise. So it is not necessary that only if an affidavit is filed by the plaintiff or the petitioner, an order of injunction, temporary injunction can be granted. If the court is otherwise satisfied, that the party is entitled to a temporary injunction order, the court can grant it. And the Supreme Court also held that even under Section 151 CPC, if the situation is not covered by this Order 39, the court can grant order of injunction, temporary injunction. And requirements now. Now we know that. In every case, a notice is necessary. We have seen that in the case of a decree of a perpetual injunction, a decree can be passed only after notice to the parties, opposite party, and hearing of the opposite party. Likewise, sanction orders also is that unless notice is issued to the opposite party and he is heard, order of injunction shall not be passed. But there is an exception to it. The exception is we call, it is ad interim ex parte injunction. That is the phrase used even by the Supreme Court, ad interim ex parte injunction. So ex parte injunction can be granted even without a notice to the opposite party. So 
so but we thought that the object of granting injunction would be defeated by the delay the court may grant injunction even before notice is issued and the respondent is heard so there should be a reason for it the reason given in the statute is that it appears to the court that the delay injunction temporary injunction will defeat the purpose of granting injunction the respondent is served with the notice and he for the court the mischief will have how to be will have been done so to avoid it to avoid that injustice being done the purpose of granting or temporary injunction is defeated the court is empowered to grant ex parte temporary injunction orders now what is the procedure so there is a special exception there is a special procedure provided for it it is mandatory for the court to record reasons for this it is mandatory for the court to record reasons for disp uh, dispensing with the notice if the reason is not stated in the order <coughs> the order is illegal so usually we just do what the, uh, the judges do judicial officers do as that and i have perused the affidavit the plaint and the documents i am satisfied that delay will defeat the purpose of grant injunction so an order of injunction is granted as party that is what we do so the court shall direct the petitioner the second requirement the court shall direct the petitioner to deliver to the opposite party or to send him by registered post immediately a copy of the application for injunction a copy of affidavit a copy of the plaint and copies of the documents <coughs> <coughs> that is the second requirement the first is that the court should record reasons the second is that the court should direct the plaint the petitioner to do certain action so copies on the other side and the the third uh, and the petition shall be directed to file on the same day or the day an affidavit of compliance so he should file an affidavit stating that he has complied with the requirements of order 39 or uh, rule 3 clause a and b clauses a and b and suppose he has not complied with it what happens what is the consequence of it the consequence is, is not that the order becomes illegal the order is still legal it is valid but if the opposite party happens to violate that order there will be no remedy for the petitioner that is the only consequence so if the petitioner fails to comply with process a and b of order rule 3 of order 39 and the order of injunction is violated by the respondent there will be no remedy for the petitioner the consequence of disobedience will not flow that is order 39 a rule 2a is not applicable in such cases that is the only consequence if it's okay there is nothing wrong in it then the period within which the application should be disposed of that is prescribed a period within which an application for a temporary injunction on the basis of an order of additive injunction is granted it should be disposed of within a particular period the court directs the uh, court directs rule 3a <clears throat> it provides that if injunction is granted without notice to the respondent the application should be disposed of within 30 days from the date of order of injunction 
Otherwise, the results should be recorded. <coughs> <coughs> And the Supreme Court has taken an extreme view through Justice Katie Thomas that if the application is not disposed of within 30 days from the date of granting this order of injunction, an appeal is maintainable. An appeal is maintainable. AR 2000 Supreme Court 3032. Then what is the purpose of granting an order of injunction, temporary injunction? The purpose is to preserve status quo. The purpose is to preserve the status quo. The relief is granted to mitigate the risk of injustice to the plaintiff during the period before which the uncertainty could be resolved. It is to protect the plaintiff from injury by violation of the rights in which he could not be adequately compensated in damages, or recoverable in the action, if the uncertainty were resolved in his favor at the trial. So the purpose will be defeated. AR 1995 Supreme Court, 2372. Gujarat Bottling Company Limited versus Coca Cola Company. <coughs> Again, that has been reiterated in AR 2598. Hindustan Petroleum Corporation Limited versus Sriman Narayan. As we all know, it is the discretion relief. But the discretion should be judicially exercised. But there are, so there are some tests to be applied. How to exercise the discretion? What circumstances this discretion can be exercised? There are four principles in granting this order of temporary injunction. They are, one, whether the plaintiff has a prima facie case. Whether the plaintiff has a prima facie case. The second, whether the balance of convenience is in favor of the plaintiff. The third, whether the plaintiff would suffer an irreparable injury if his prior is disallowed. And the fourth one is conduct of the petitioner. These are the four considerations in granting or not granting it or the temporary injection. Temporary prohibitory injection. Prima facie case should not be misunderstood as prima facie title. Prima facie case is different from prima facie title. Prima facie title has to be, or the title has to be established at the trial. The, whether the prima facie case means, is there a substantial question which has to be uh, raised, the bon which has been raised in bona fide. And needs investigation and a decision on merits. This is what is called the prima facie case. Whether the plaintiff has, the petitioner has a debatable case. Whether he has a de debatable case. Existence of a prima facie right and infraction of the enjoyment of the right by one of the, by the plaintiff is a condition for the grant of temporary injection. So he has to prove the existence of a prima facie case. That is 1992, volume 1, SEC 719. It gives the meaning of prima facie case. It's 
it should not be confused with the prime of the cetite. Then the other one is the balance of convenience. It is a substantial mischief for injury which is likely to be caused to the persons if the injunction is refused or is granted. The need of the plaintiff to be protected against the alleged injury by violation of his right and the corresponding need of the defendant. So being, being, corresponding need of the defendant to be protected against the injury resulting from his having been prevented from exercising his own legal rights must be waived. So plus and minus points should be waived. A wing should be done. This process is called balance of convenience. A year 1995 Supreme Court, <coughs> 2372. 2372. So we have seen the meaning of a prima facie case, balance of convenience. And the third one is irreparable injury. Ordinarily, it is no non-availability of remedies other than the injunction for the protection of the plaintiff from the consequence of the apprehended injury. So no other immediate uh, remedy is available. Equally efficacious remedies is available. Remedy is available. However, it does not mean that there must be no physical possibility of repairing the injury. It does not mean that it should be impossible. Repairable injury does not mean that it cannot be repaired, impossible to repair. No. It only means that the injury must be a material one. That cannot be adequately compensated by way of damages. Suppose the prayer is to restrain the defendant respondent from demolishing a building. Okay, if the building is demolished, then it can be reconstructed. There is, it is not impossible. But what about the hardship? What about the hardship? So it is a material one. The injury becomes a material one. That is the meaning of the, the term repairable injury and does not mean that it is impossible to repair it. Impossibility is not the question. Whether a material injury will, be, will result from it, uh, 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 violation of injunction or this uh, particular act. And irreparable injury is must. Irreparable injury is must. 2012, volume 6, SEC, 792. Even in the absence of irreparable injury, the court cannot grant uh, injunction merely of, for the reason that relief. My discretion. I am exercising in favor of the plaintiff, even though there is no repairable injury case. Now, the court cannot say so. And the last one is conduct of the petitioner. Conduct of the petitioner. Usually, we say that the petitioner should come with clean hands. The petitioner should clean with clean, clean hands so that he may be given a an order of injunction. The reason is that it is an equitable remedy. So that's why, apart from the other facts, the considerations, the court will look to the conduct of the petitioner also. So unless it is conducted from blame, he cannot be granted an order of injunction. 
he has to show that he himself is not at fault and he himself is not responsible for bringing about the state of things complained of and that he is not unfair or inequitable in his dealings with the respondent in other words his conduct should be fair and honest his conduct should be fair and honest that is the gujarat bodling case we have already seen AR 1995 Supreme Court 2372. The terms are now explained by the Supreme Court. All these terms are explained. Then another important decision, which. gives the factors to be weighed before granting injunction is morgan stanley mutual fund versus kartik das 1994 volume 4 sec 225 now suppose all the ingredients which are necessary to entitle the plaintiff petitioner to an order of injunction are present or it is uh, it they exist is the court bound to grant an order of injunction the court is not bound to grant an injunction since it is inequitable relief it is a judicial discretion that is to be exercised that is a ar 2001 supreme court 2367 then 2000 volume 9 acc 572 now there are some certain there are certain circumstances in which the court shall not grant an order of injunction temporary injunction the first one is no injunction shall be granted if it is beyond the order scope of the suit if it is beyond the scope of the suit ar 1999 supreme court 2322 then no injunction can be granted to perpetuate a wrong the petitioner has done a wrong to the defendant and he wants to get protection to continue that wrong that is to perpetuate that wrong that cannot be granted 1993 volume 3 acc 161 no injunction shall be granted if it amounts to abuse of the process of the court if it amounts to abuse of the process of the court 1995 supplement 4 cc 574 then no injunction can be granted it if, if it amounts to final disposal of the suit the relief prayed for in the suit it is granted in the form of an temporary injunction order no cannot be granted 2003 volume 6 cc 64 we have already seen that the purpose of granting an order of temporary injunction is to preserve the status quo preserve the status quo 
it was that the court cannot grant an injunction which is in post which has a positive import or allowing a party to do a certain thing injunction of negative import alone can be granted AR 1995 Supreme Court 441. Then, no order of injunction can be granted against a true owner of the property unless the plaintiff is in settled possession. Settled possession. What is meant by settled possession? This has been explained in several cases, right from A. R. Nine Sixty Eight Supreme Court Seven or Two. Air Service Society Limited versus Father uh, Alexander. Nineteen Sixty Eight Supreme Court Seven or Two. Nineteen Seventy Four Volume One S. E. C. Forty Eight. Nineteen eighty nine, four SEC one thirty one, nineteen ninety five, volume three SEC four twenty six, two thousand four, SEC sixty nine. A. R. Two thousand six Supreme Court eleven forty eight. Sorry, that is a different one. It's a different one. Need not write it. Then what is meant by settled possession? Possession. A rightful owner who has been wrongly dispossessed of land may retake possession. He can do so peacefully. Sorry, so I'm sorry. The definition that is another one. Settled possession means when a exercising when a person exercises peacefully the ordinary rights of ownership. That is called settled possession. So his possession should be peaceable. He should or exercise the rights ordinarily exercised by the owner of the property. Then only we can say that it will be possession. He only is entitled to maintain a suit for possession against a true owner because the principle is that nobody shall be allowed to take law in his own hands. If he has some grievance, he should go to the court. That is the principle behind it. Now, sometimes injunctions are prayed for against the corners. The nature of the corner should be such that every corner is corner or is an owner of every inch of the property. He has all the rights of the owners or the owner. His right is not limited or conditioned. So, ordinarily, an order of injunction shall be granted against a corner. But there are exceptions. The exception is this: no injunction shall be granted against unless the court's action is inconsistent with the right of the corner. Suppose he cuts and removes all the valuable trees in the property, that is inconsistent. Suppose he makes a construction of a building, valuable building, without the consent of others, that is inconsistent with his rights because the others are also owners; they are also are entitled to the same rights. So when it is inconsistent with the right of a corner, an order of injunction can be passed against 
a corner or so. 1996, volume 11 cc. <coughs> 696. Then, in the case of bank guarantees, no order of injunction shall be passed unless there is a likelihood of fraud or fraud is alleged or likelihood of irretrievable injustice injustice unless fraud is alleged or there is a likelihood of irretrievable injustice injunction shall not be granted so bank guarantees AR 1991 Supreme Court, <coughs> 1994, AR 2006 Supreme Court, 1148, 1148. Then I have already told you that no injunction bank granted to do a positive action. That is only of a negative import, it can be granted. I have already told you. I think I have given the decision also. Nineteen ninety-four post five Supreme Court four forty-one. Then in the case of these sections or elected bodies, like cooperative societies or other associations, no injunction can be granted. If its effect is to extend the court by an order of injunction cannot extend the term of an elected body. 2000 volume 9 SEC 748. And at the initial stage, I told you that. When an order of injunction is granted, or instead of passing an order of injunction, the court should not pass an order of status quo. And in the cases, uh, uh, while the court grants an injunction restraining the defendant respondent from doing an act, the court shall pass a direction to the effect that the respondent also shall not do certain things to the property. This has been recognized by the Supreme Court in AR 1995 Supreme Court 2372. The Supreme Court has held that in appropriate cases, the court should direct the plaintiff to give an undertaking or to furnish bond to compensate the defendant if the claim is subsequently rejected. So the court is within its power to issue such a direction. In addition to the order, direct him to do a particular act. If the claim is subsequently by the court, you shall compensate. No violation, violation. Disobedience, order 39, rule 2 ACPC. What are the remedies? The remedies are, we have already seen the supplemental section 94. We have already seen section 94. Then, attachment plus detention. Attachment and detention. That is the description of the court. What is attachment, the effect? Attachment is enforcement. Attachment is nothing but enforcement. 
then why detention? What is the nature of that order of detention? Is it punishment? Or is it an order only to see that this order is enforced? No. It is a penal in nature. It is punishment. It is detention order passed under Order 39 Rule 2 is actually a punishment. ND7 Supreme Court 1240. Supreme Court. Me versus Hindu. A party considers the order passed by the court is uh, void or illegal or voidable. Which is it? Party who considers the order void or voidable cannot treat it as such and disavow it. Majesty of law. He shall come to the court complaining that it is a void order. Bringing it to the notice of the court that is a void order. So it should be vacated. The latest decision is 2017, volume 1 SEC, 622. Then, what's the difference between injunction and stay order? Injunction and stay order. The difference. Both are prohibitory orders. But we have seen that all prohibitory orders are not orders of injunction. Then what are the differences? The order of stay is addressed to the courts. It is an order addressed to the court. Don't proceed with the case. The order of injunction is passed against a party. So one is a directed to the court, the other is to the party. In the case of stay order, the court to which it is addressed does not lose due resistance. Does not lose due resistance to deal with the matter unless it has a knowledge of the stay. The court has power to set aside the proceedings taken between the stay order and the receipt of the communication of the stay order if it is asked to do so and necessary in the interest of justice. In the interest of justice. Then inherent powers. Inherent powers. The court has inherent power to grant an order of injunction. Though a case is not covered by Order 39. That is AR 1962 Supreme Court 527. A year 2007 Supreme Court 1376. Two thousand nine one SEC 240. There are other decisions also. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> 
whether violation of injunction is a contempt of court, whether it is contempt of court. Power exercised by the court under Order 39 and Rule 2 is a punitive in nature. I have already given you the decision. That is akin to the power to punish for civil contempt under the Contempt of Courts Act 1971. A year 2009, Supreme Court 2330. Suppose, if the order of injunction is uh, after passing this order of injunction, it was a set aside. Meanwhile, the respondent had violated the order. That means an order of injunction is passed, it is violated. Subsequently, the order was set aside by the court. What is the consequence? Whether Order 39 Rule 2A is uh, attracted. The Supreme Court in AR 1998, Supreme Court 2765 has held that the consequences of disobedience will follow. The consequence of disobedience will follow. Another situation also we can consider. An order of injunction was passed. Subsequently, it was found that the court had no jurisdiction. But in between, the order was violated. What is the consequence? Whether Order 39 Rule 2A is attracted? Yes. The, uh, the provision in Order 39, Rule 2A, is, CPC is attracted. A year 1997, Supreme Court 120. So I told you that violation may is a violation actually amounts to contempt of a civil contempt of court. But the remedy is not under the contempt of court action. So merely because it amounts to contempt of court, civil contempt of the court, you cannot rush to the court with a petition under the contempt of court act. Your remedy lies only under Order 39 Go to A. That is Food Corporation of India versus Suktev Prasad. 2009, Volume 5 SEC. Six sixty five. This is the observation of the Supreme Court. The power exercised by, exercised by a court under Order Thirteen and Rule Two A CPC is the punitive in nature, akin to the punishment for civil contempt under the Contempt of Court Act. I have already given.
Yes. Now come to <clears throat> section forty one, section forty one, clause B, specific relief act. It runs the, uh, thus: an injunction cannot be granted to restrain any person from instituting or prosecuting any proceeding in a court not subordinate that court from which the injunction is sought. What does it mean? It means that only an injunction can be granted only if the other court is an inferior court. An injunction cannot be granted from instituting or prosecuting a proceeding in a court of concurrent jurisdiction or a superior court. Not subordinate. A court having a concurrent jurisdiction, example, so some uh, civil, uh, civil judges, uh, uh, additional civil judges having the same powers, same court, same jurisdiction. It's not an inferior court. So it will lie only in only against a proceeding in an inferior court. A.R. 1983 Supreme Court, 1272. 1272. I think uh, I have uh, dealt with the all the provisions which require notice. So far as the practicing lawyer is concerned, the provisions which have only an academic interest, I have not dealt with. You all get it in books. You can go through it. And almost all the positions are settled by the Supreme Court also. There cannot be any confusion about it. So I think we can wind up and we can. Anybody has any doubt? I yes, shall try to clarify it. This does not mean that I'll be able to clarify all your doubts. No. So we have agree is status quo equal to an ad interim injunction. Yes. Is status quo equal to an ad interim injunction? Ah, that is considered so. But its effect is what will be the nature of the order? The respondent will maintain status quo, right? The respondent will maintain status quo. What does the law provide? The law provides that if he is entitled to injunction, an order of injunction shall be passed. That is what you are, that is his entitlement, not the status quo order. The plaintiff is entitled to get an order of injunction, not an order of status quo. And suppose the order is that both parties shall maintain status quo. What does it mean? You are injuring both parties. But what is the fundamental thing that is required? The court should know what the status quo is. Without knowing what the status quo is, no court shall pass an order of status quo, even if it is only against the defendant or respondent or against both parties. No such order shall be passed because that will give rise to further litigation and police cases. Uh, sir, uh, can I ask you a question, sir, regarding sir, the same? No, we need to ask questions, but I am not always, I will not be able to give answers always. Yes. No problem, sir. Thank you. Uh, sir, here, uh, my case, actually, I have filed a uh, case uh, wherein I have prayed for a temporary injunction to restrain uh, the build. Ma madam, madam, is it a pending matter? Yes, pending, sir. Pending not matter questions may be avoided. Uh, sir, uh, <laughs> I think it would be beneficial to ask. You can ask. No problem. Uh, it's on, my the facts of the case, on the facts of the pending matter, please, 
Don't yeah, I, I, yes, sir. I'll not disclose all the details. Yeah. Just okay. uh, I'll just cover the outlines of the matter. That's all. Yeah. Uh, you know, I you know my client is a society. Uh, it's yeah. a something different uh, case. Uh, you know, my client is a society wherein they wanted to restrain that is the for dependence. Society, they are the plaintiffs, sir. Yes. Okay, here the maintenance services are provided by the builder. Yes. Oh, okay. I see. Yes, sir. What was done uh, in the in this corona period is he suddenly issued a short, very short period of notice stating that, you know, you look after uh, uh, henceforth the services part by the society. Uh, we are vacating from so-and-so date. It's a very short period. So I went to the trial court and filed a uh, interim application period along with the plaint. So the court after what is hearing, the, what is the what is the what is the wrong done by the other party? Suddenly they gave a very short notice, sir. That's a very ten days short notice. Notice asking you to uh, stating that they will vacate from the uh, sorry they will terminate the services maintenance services. Oh, I say you are providing maintenance. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so my client uh, has filed a petition in the trial court stating mm. that, uh, you know, it's a very short period of notice, kindly mm. grant a temporary injunction under order yes. 39, rule 1 and 2, sir. Yes. Wherein, uh, after hearing, um, uh, the learned trial uh, um, judge has yes. granted status quo order. <laughs> <laughs> status quo order. Yes. So here, how I interpreted it, interpreted is maintain the same status as on the date. I will give you an example, one one story. Yes, sir. Which I used to tell my trainees at the Judicial Academy. Yes, sir. There was a dispute over a way, a right of way. Okay. Between the plaintiff and defendants, mm -hmm. they are neighbors. Okay. The person who is aggrieved by that action of the other party, that is the plaintiff, went to the court and obtained, obtained an order of status quo. An order of status quo. Okay. But meanwhile, before this order was obtained, the copy of the order was obtained. The police, at the instance of the defendant, okay. summoned him to the police session. And when he was at the police session, his agent came to the police station with a copy of the order. See, this is a civil case. The police shall not interfere. Yes. Sir. And the court has passed an order of interdict. Passed an order. Mm. Then the sub inspector, the sub inspector was actually uh, was assaulting this uh, plaintiff. In mm. the midst of this assault, copy of this order was given to him. Then he read it. Ah, what is the order? The order is to maintain status quo. So what is the status quo at the police station? He was assaulting the plaintiff. So the court has directed me to maintain status quo. So I will maintain status quo. I will continue to assault you. This is the problem with the order status quo orders. Without knowing the order status, knowing the status quo, if an order status quo is passed, that the consequences will be disastrous. That's the problem. Yes. So sir. ordinarily, that is why the Supreme Court no such order is passed. When you are about to pass an order of injunction, why don't you pass an order of injunction? Mm -hmm. The law, the act, the court, specific fact, neither the specific fact nor the um, CPC provides for passing an order of status quo. Only pass an order of injunction if the party is entitled. You give it to him. So it is wrong on the part of the judicial officer to pass order of status quo in such situation. So, but it can be actually it can be interpreted in my words, in my view, it can be interpreted as an order of status quo means it is an order of injunction. It is an order of injunction. But whether if it is disobeyed, order 13 and rule 2A will be applicable. It is a guesswork for you. That's the problem. Uh, sir, sorry for the interruption. 
uh, here I would like to ask you one more thing. So if you consider status quo yeah. is an order of injunction, then shouldn't the, uh, uh, the learned judge uh, mention the, record the reasons for granting the status quo? If it is that's an injunction? See, that is the problem. The rule says that an uh, order shall not be passed in S party without giving reasons. So to avoid it, what this they just do? They pass order of status quo. That is circumventing the provision. Yes, sir. Shall not be allowed to happen. That's yes. the problem. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, uh, sir, one, sorry, one more question, sir. You are from which state? I'm from uh, Telangana state, sir. Hyderabad. Ah, yes, your academy is there. Your academy is there. Mr. Murthy was the director of Judicial Academy. We had one session with Mr. Murthy also. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, so we give uh, these instructions to our judicial officers in our academy. Don't pass on such status quo. Yes, sir. The uh, party will be the losers. Exactly, sir. Here, a large number of people have suffered in this corona period yes. and uh, couldn't explain in words. That's the problem. The party will be utter confusion. Utter confusion. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, here uh, one more question, sir. Yes. Uh, so, if we, whenever we prefer an appeal from the orders, IA yes. orders, um, and we, if we seek for uh, from, the, from from which order? Order of injunction. Yes, sir. From yes. the order of injunction, if we prefer an appeal under forty three, under mm -hmm. order forty three of order forty three. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and. Uh, uh, along with the appeal, if we prefer an IA for temporary suspension of the orders, mm. temporary suspension of the uh, lower court orders, mm. then is it mandatory for the uh, appellate court to uh, uh, suspend or is it discretionary to suspend the lower court orders? There is no question of suspending an order of injunction. There is no question of suspending. How can you suspend that order? Is it an order of injunction or order of refusal of injunction? What is the nature of that order? Uh, order of vacating the injunction. The order Vacate. was vacated. Yes, sir. So that means you want a fresh order of injunction. Uh, sorry, order sir. Order vacated. By the yes. private interest. Yes, sir. Court of first instance vacated the order of injunction which was already granted to you. Yes, sir. That was vacated. You are challenging that order. Yes, sir. That means you have to get an order of injunction from the appellate court. It's no question of suspending order. Okay. The fresh order has to be passed. Oh, that is the only remedy. Okay. On merits. Ah, what merits? If the court is satisfied, just like this. Uh, uh, um, uh, court of first instance under order 39. It's also passed under order 39. Okay. Okay, sir. Thank you so no much, sir. Suspending in order which is vacated. And where the suspension is used in law only in, with regard to this uh, sentence in criminal cases and conviction, order of conviction. I mean, like a stay. Sorry to use the wrong word. Uh, I mean to say it's a stay of the Stay. Yeah, stay of. Oh, yeah. Stay. Stay of. Uh, what was stayed by the trial court? Originally? No, sir. I mean, what I meant to say is trial court vacated. Yeah. Then again, there is no question of stay. To stay an order, an order should be in force. There is no order in force, it is vacated. Uh, I mean, so here... there's no question of staying it. Okay. What um, you want is what you want is to get an order again, not suspension. You must get an order of injunction from the appellate court. That is your remedy. Because okay. an appellate court has all the powers of the original court. You must get that order from the appellate court. Okay. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So we will ask uh, Gayatri, ma'am. She's an assistant professor in CMR uh, Legal Studies of the CMR University to propose the vote of thanks. Then we will ask Mr. Manish Lamba.
Over to you, Gayatri, ma'am. Uh, unmute, Gayatri, ma'am. Ma'am, you will have to unmute yourself. Gayatri, ma'am. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Can you hear me, sir? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, very good evening to all. I deem it a great honor and privilege to propose the vote of thanks on this memorable occasion on behalf of Beyond Law, CLC and CMR School of Legal Studies, CMR University, the knowledge partner. First and foremost, we express our deep felt gratitude to our today's speaker, Justice Hebra Matthew, former judge, Kerala High Court, for his insightful talk on law of injunctions, theory and practice. His lordship made us to understand under what circumstances can party apply for injunctions, kinds, features, purpose, principles of granting perpetual injunctions, prohibitory injunctions, and rules of specific relief act, and also order of detention and so many other things. Thank you, Lordship, for your insightful address. Uh, we're also grateful to our Thank knowledge you. partner, Mr. Manish Lamba, uh, for taking us through ancient literature concept, the darkness to light for uh, this World Happiness Day. Thank you, sir. We are grateful to our beloved team, Professor T.R. Subramanya, CMR School of Legal Studies, CMR University, for his encouragement and continuous support. Thank you, sir. We thank all the distinguished audience who are following the Instagram and Facebook, Beyond Law, CL CLC, uh, the learned advocates, the research scholars, participants, and all of the distinguished invitees present here. Thank you all. I also express my sincere thanks to host Beyond Law, CLC, and Mr. Vikas uh, uh, Chatrat, sir, for organizing this webinar for today. Thank you all. Uh, World Happiness Day to all. Be happy, stay safe, stay blessed. Thank you. Thank Audience. you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you so uh, much. What a, what a wonderful summarization of the entire law relating to injunctions. What can be granted, what cannot be granted, what is permanent and what is temporary, what is a stay and what is order with respect to status quo. It was a wonderful journey uh, of the last uh, more than 100 years of case laws were quoted. It is very difficult for me to even take notes. The manner in which Lord Justice Abraham Matthew has rattled out citations and cases, uh, this can only come from an expert. Whether it was the Coca-Cola uh, Gujarat Potlers case where injunction can be granted, where negative covenants can be uh, implemented where it cannot be implemented in the entire law. Injunction to a civil lawyer is same as bail to a criminal lawyer. And uh, you never get a second chance to make your first impression. And the first impression to the client in the court, prima facie in a suit, is made, by, made in an injunction application. Prima facie, the case on the first day is decided, and then the entire merits takes place. Um, and going deeper into the evidence, the things may be different. But the four cardinal pillars and uh, pillars on which this entire law is uh, uh, rests has been very beautifully explained by uh, Lord Justice Abraham Matthew that there has to be a prima facie case. What is a prima facie case will depend upon the facts and circumstances of the case. The balance of convenience needs to be there, and that balance is in the judge's mind and those facts and the grounds and the reasoning which has been uh, tendered across the bar will examine that whether the balance, wherever the balance tilts, that is where the justice will be done. And there, there needs to be irreparable harm and injury. And very beautifully, uh, your lordships have explained that what is irreparable harm and injury? Irreparable harm and injury is not impossibility. You know, irreparable harm and injury is that which cannot be measured and the pain of the litigant, which the which a judge needs to um, uh, feel and empathize with, that whether or not that is an irreparable harm and injury, of yeah. all the conduct, the conduct that would be of the plaintiff in hands, whether or not he has come um, immediately, whether or not there have been latches, whether or not he is taking advantage of his own wrong, or whether or not it will be just and equitable the manner in which this entire uh, law relating to injunction, whether under the CPC or under the Specific Relief Act, it has been explained. It is a mammoth task 
um, in one and a half hours. Um, it has been beautifully summarized. I hope uh, practitioners and students of law would take notes and would refer to all those pearls of wisdoms in the judgments, the citations which have been quoted uh, will be noted off. And uh, we are happy on this happiness day and we are too happy to have you, sir. And we are honored and privileged. A great thank you to Gayatri ma'am, to Vikas, and above all, uh, Lord Justice uh, Abraham Matthew. So kind of you. We are all thankful for the pearls of wisdom. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you. you the, thank you very much. Thank you to the CMR uh, Legal Studies, CMR University, and Sadhguru And after the way Manish Lamba and Gayatri ma'am have summed up, I don't think it requires further because already we have a lot of cherries and toppings on the cake to express the vote of thanks, the way sir has expressed all this as to how the balance of convenience, irreparable loss, and what we say is prem of shai case have to be seen for injunction. And what is the difference between the temporary and the permanent injunctions and the subtle differences between specific relief act. And a lot of people like sir rightly said, where the co-sharer could be filed, otherwise normally um, one carries the impression that there couldn't be a petition against a co-sharer seeking injunction, etc. Uh, so thank you to all those participants who have been watching us live on the Facebook and on this platform. And in the endeavor to continue with our series on 26th, we would be having a session on a burden of proof by Justice Bilappa from Karnataka High Court. Do stay connected with us on 26th. Everyone stay safe and stay blessed. And as we said, it's a happiness day. So today I add another, since the corona is rising, that everyone should be rather be happy and not stressed out with the corona. And we all believe that we should come across through the corona and with the positivity of life on a happiness day. Everyone stay safe, stay blessed. And thank you to Justice Abraham Matthew, who has always been kind enough to share his knowledge on this platform. Thank you, sir. Everyone, thank you. Thank you. Have a good day.